But when the rubber meets the road, it's like, hey, if you're a teacher and you have an idea for an awesome school, can you actually get that school off the ground and serve families in your neighborhood that you know and love uh, legally um, and operate? And in a lot of cities in the US, the answer to that is like, yes, but you need to have a couple hundred thousand dollars for lobbyists and lawyers, and you need to probably have two years of your life to give to try to get this thing off the ground. And I think that's insane. Hello and welcome back to the Hannah Franklin Podcast. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Ryan Delk. Ryan is the founder of Primer, a network of micro schools being built across the country. And on today's episode, Ryan and I talk about his experience growing up in what effectively was a micro school after his mom left her job as a professional teacher to educate her own kids and other kids in the neighborhood. We talk about how that experience impacted Ryan and how it affects how he thinks about the schools that he's building. We talk about what makes a good micro school and from a first principle standpoint, what the most important things are to be thinking about in developing schools and educational experiences for kids. And we talk about Primer's project-based approach to educating kids, not just academically, but also in the realm of skills and emotional intelligence and self-esteem and self-efficacy. We go deep in the rabbit holes of what is involved in building out not just a singular micro school, but a network of micro schools and what the future of education in a world full of micro schools might look like. I had so much fun talking to Ryan and I hope you enjoy listening. Also, if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple, please take a moment to leave me a five-star review. Reviews are super helpful for landing future guests. The more reviews a show has, the more legitimate it looks. So please take a moment to click five stars on Spotify or Apple, wherever you're listening to this show. And if you're watching on YouTube, please remember to like and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. Thanks, friends. Ryan Delk, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Hannah. I'm so stoked for this conversation. I've been following the work that you're doing for quite a while. Uh, As people who listen to the show know, I'm a huge fan of micro schools, and you're doing so much awesome work to redefine what micro schools can be and fit them into the broader landscape of education in a very aggressive and ambitious way. And I'm super stoked to talk about all of this today. Can you really briefly give me like the elevator pitch of Primer for people who aren't familiar? We don't need to get too into the weeds of what it is. We'll talk about that later, but just set the stage for me, what you're doing. Yeah, so we believe that um, basically that it's possible with technology to empower top 1% teachers to launch schools in their neighborhood, like locations that they understand, markets they understand and can serve well, and that we can use technology to create a really high agency experience for kids. So um, kids at Primer spend their mornings going really deep on self-paced academics where they set the goals, they're in the driver's seat, they can see transparently how they're doing, how they're tracking against their goals. And then in the afternoon, they have time to go deep on things they're passionate about, whether that's a microbiology course or starting a company or launching a podcast like this. Um, they can go deep on the things that motivate them and excite them. And so um, it's a little bit of a, a new model, uh, but it really all comes down to empowering exceptional teachers. Um, and we believe that they're sort of like the unsung heroes of the education world and that when you can kind of help them get out of the sort of bureaucratic system, um, that really amazing things happen. I want to talk a little bit about the split you just described between between academics and projects. I think there are the legacy system is very heavily focused on academics to the point that there really isn't room for a lot else. And the electives or extracurriculars that kids do sign up for, they're very, they're not individual centric at all. It's like you join band or choir and you're involved in this group activity where you get to say like, maybe we got adjudicated at the end of the year, but we didn't have like an actual, I didn't create a project that goes in my portfolio that I've built. And I see this pendulum swing happening among a lot of people who are building alternative programs where they're really hyper-focused on, like, let's give kids space to work on the things that they actually care about, which I think is really exciting and really valuable for the kids. But talk to me a little bit about how you developed this, sort of the thesis around what you wanted the education for kids at Primer to look like and how you structure this split between the standard stuff kids are expected to know and the things they actually want to be doing. Yeah. So um, 
all credit for this goes to Lindsay Freeman, who's our kind of head of the academic model at Primer. Um, but it was actually, I think, originally, the original ideas for Primer, and we can talk more about this if you'd like, came from my own education. My mom was a public school teacher who, um, we can talk more about it, but left her job to basically start a micro school, start a homeschool co-op um, for us. And it was really very similar to my education. Like we had she had very straightforward academic goals for us, and we knew exactly what we had to accomplish academically and like math and reading that year. And she kind of put us in the driver's seat. And I remember one year she like wrote out everything that I had to get done that year, like on a you know five sheets of paper. And it was kind of like, hey, you can go as fast as slow as you want through this. Um, and then after that, we had time in the afternoon to do things that we were excited about. And so I was, you know, starting businesses, making things, whatever I, you know, whatever I wanted to do. That was sort of, you know, it's it all like you had to work hard on it, but it was there's was a lot of freedom around it. Um, and so I just think it's it's when you think about the like the the traditional the goals of the traditional education system it's this very linear process of like you know elementary middle high college get a job and you know the the goal post of K through 12 has always been like college admissions and I just think that if you zoom out from all that and you think about what the goal of education should be it's really like help kids reach their potential like and find a fulfilling life and um, academics, I believe, are a part of that. I'm not, we're not sort of like, we're not unschoolers at primary. Like, I do believe that, like, it's important to say, like, hey, you, as, as a kid, you need to learn these math concepts or you need to learn these reading concepts. Like, we do have an opinion on those things and we are pretty direct with parents and kids about that. But I want kids spending their time experimenting with what makes them tick and what makes them excited and what, you know, makes them, you know, so pumped to get out of bed in the morning and work on. And the traditional system really does not give you any time to do that really at all in K through 12, maybe some high schools do, but certainly not in elementary and middle school. Um, and I think that's what, that's what gets me really excited is the idea and what we've seen of kids actually like finding that sort of like moment of resonance between their heart or their soul or whatever, you, whatever words you want to use and like the thing they're working on and the thing they're passionate about. And then how that unlocks this different view for them about well, what they can do with the rest of their life or um, what success looks like for them. So um, I think it really comes down to like what your what your belief of the goals of education is. Um, and then, you know, if you if you have a different belief in the traditional system, you would obviously not have the same structure of the school day, uh, which is where primers ended up. So how do you define the belief of primer as an organization and you personally, too, of what a good education is? Like, how do you know if you've done your job? What are you delivering to kids? I mean, I think of it as every kid has this sort of, uh, you know, this whatever level of potential they have inside of them. And that's a combination of, um, you know, their their family upbringing and their family situation and um, DNA and all sorts of different things that that go into making each kid who they are. And um, I think that, that the world can sort of um, push a filter onto kids of what success looks like or what they should be. Um, and I, I think that part of the goal of primary, we don't do high school yet, but when we do do high school, um, part of the goal is really like, how can you help K through 12 be a much more fluid transition into the quote unquote real world, where if you're a kid that wants to start a small business or launch a tech company or go to Harvard or whatever you want to do, your K through 12 experience should be tailored to help you like give you the highest probability chance of succeeding at that thing. And so for me, I, I just think about it as like the early years, we, we want kids to spend as much time as possible exploring things, figuring out what makes them tick, figuring out what where the intrinsic motivation is for them. And then as they get older, they, it's more and more time applying that to like things that are more legible to the outside world in terms of projects or companies or um, things they want to take on. And then ideally, once you know, once primary launches high school, there's there's a, a fluid transition between those experiences and things like apprenticeships or mentorships or internships or jobs or whatever they're excited about um, and want to spend time on. And so, I think that fluidity is probably the the key sort of defining differentiator between how we think about um, a you know a, a first grader going from first grade into you know having a job at 25 versus how the traditional system sort of uh, compartmentalizes it as like just sort of like conveyor belt steps between. K through 12 in college and then getting a job. I want to talk about your experience a little bit growing up homeschooled because I also grew up homeschooled, which has very much influenced my point of view on what education can be, where it's failing kids, where I feel like I just got stupidly lucky in having a great education. And I've heard you talk yep. about your experience before, and it sounds like you kind of have a similar perspective what do you think your mom got right about how she homeschooled you that's impacted how you think about working with kids in primer? Um, she got a lot of things right. I think, 
uh, it's kind of interesting now, like reading books on education and all the things that are like in vogue now um, in terms of pedagogy and then thinking about our experience when like there really a lot of these things like there wasn't even really words for, but she was just kind of doing it intuitively. Um, I think the two things that stick out to me were one, she, she would make everything possible experiential. Like if there was some way to make it experiential, we would make it experiential. And we didn't have a lot of money. Like we weren't like, you know, it wasn't like they were spending a ton of money on this stuff. But when, you know, she, when it was time to learn about the American Revolution, she put us in a minivan and we drove from Florida up the coast and visited a bunch of the 13 colonies and, um, you know, like walked the path that Paul Revere, you know, rode his horse on and um, saw these historical sites and it wasn't, uh, you know, it, it was it was in the moment you're like, oh, this is like a cool trip. Like, this is, you know, awesome. Um, but then as an adult, like there's I have such a richer like ex- sort of understanding and I think love for American history because of the way that she uh, helped us experience these things for the first time. It wasn't in a textbook. It wasn't in a history class. It was like, no, we're going like we're we're going to spend two weeks and we're going to go do this. Um, I remember when it was time to learn about the respiratory system, she went to like a butcher or a cow processing plant or I don't know, some somewhere and she got the lungs from a cow and brought them home in a cooler and like, you know, inflated them and like showed us how like the lungs inflate and deflate. And um, you know, it was like this really super cool experience that I still remember, whatever, 20 something years later, 30 years later. Um and so just at every turn, if there was some way for her to make it hands-on, experiential, out of the box, like she would do that. The second thing was just I think a, a really big emphasis on agency from even from a very young age. And I think that she treated us like fully formed human beings um, that could make decisions and allocate our time um, much earlier than most parents would have. And that was uh, pretty foundational to how she approached the academic part of our education. And so she was not lax by any means. Like she, it wasn't like, hey, you know, you can do math or not do math. I don't really care. It was, you know, she was very clear about like, hey, these are, these are the grade levels. This is what you need to accomplish. Um, you know, this is what I expect. These are the state standards. Um, but it was, it was sort of the posture of it was this like very high agency posture towards us that I think for me and my siblings helped us feel like we were more in the driver's seat and more sort of in control of how we approached our education than most kids homeschooled or not. Can you talk a little bit more about the agency component and the self-direction? Cause that's something that's another word that gets kicked around a lot in the conversation of what education ought to be. There's the sort of like legacy camp and then there's the self-directed child-centric education camp are kind of in my mind, like the two really big buckets. Like people have a lot of different opinions about what an alternative education ought to look like. And we'll get into that as we go. There's a lot there to dive into, but people are very pro, even if they disagree on like, well, you should be, kids should be learning, reading the classics or they should be having Socratic dialogue or they should be working on projects. Everybody kind of agrees that it should be student centric and as much as possible, it should be self-directed. What did that actually yep. look like in practice for you? I think it changed a lot based on uh, age, but I remember like the example that I, that like hits me when I think about this is like, um, I don't remember if I asked her to do this or she just proactively did this, but I wanted to understand like, what do I actually need to do for like, whatever it was fifth grade math or something, some, some grade around there. Mm-hmm. And like, I want to know what I need to accomplish for the year. And I want to know when I'm done and I want to be able to go do it in two months or six months or whatever. And she just like wrote, she spent whatever, like three hours and just like wrote down every single concept that I would need to like know. And by the end of the year, and she handed it to me and I had that paper like for the entire year. And it was basically like, I could just work through it at my own pace. And if I got stuck on things, like she would help me and I could, you know, do 10 of them in a day or one of them in a day or whatever. Um, but it, it felt like it was a very transparent and like mature way to engage about this thing of like, Hey, there are expectations for you. This is not like a fully open-ended experience. Um, here's what I expect. Here's what we expect as your parents and we believe is important for you to learn for your own, you know, academic and moral formation as a human being. Um, but you, you, you're kind of in the driver's seat. And if you want to get all this done by January, then cool. Like you can decide if you want to go on to sixth grade or you can decide if you want to just not do math for us here. That's fine. Like you kind of have control over it. And I think that experience was like, th- th- that was sort of like a very similar approach that she took with things where, it wasn't, um, you know, sort of a full on like unschooling approach where it was just kind of like, hey, whatever you want to do with the time is totally fine. There were expectations. There was very clear goals academically, but the posture was always sort of like maximum transparency, maximum agency for us um, in a way that I, at least at that time, felt was really powerful. 
And how much of that are you translating over into the educational paradigm that you have at Primer? How much agency or how are you giving agency to kids inside of your classrooms? So kids, um, so when they join Primer, they, we, we, Primer works in five-week sprints. And so um, every five weeks they uh, can view. So when they take, a, they take like a, you know, sort of existing, a, a placement test at the beginning of the year, and then we show them a transparent view of every skill that they would need to know for, say, sixth grade math. And we show them what they already know, what they don't know. And it's 100% transparent. They can just see it in real time. And as they progress every day and master different skills, that dashboard updates in real time and they can see what, how, they're, how they're doing. And so at the beginning of every five-week session, they set a goal and they can choose if they, what speed they want to go. So they can select different speeds and they have like sort of a base level speed and they have these faster speeds. And progressing faster obviously means more time spent. And so we actually show them on the dashboard like, okay, you can choose lightning, but you're going to need to work for 90 minutes more a day or 30 minutes more a day or whatever in order to accomplish but if you do that through the end of the year, you'll do not only fifth grade math, but you'll do all of sixth grade math by the end of the year, and you'll be a full grade level ahead in math. And that'll be awesome. Mm -hmm. And so kids can set these goals, but they have to lock them in at the beginning of the five weeks, and they can't change them. And then once they lock them in, they're accountable to their micro school leader and to their parents for those goals. But what's crazy is that kids, when you actually like have them set their goal and they feel like they have some agency over it, they take them extremely seriously. And so kids are like, you know, screenshotting how they're doing and like sending it to their parents or sending it to their teachers. And the teachers are sending it to me to be like, oh, look at how the student is like, you know, she's so excited. She's like, you know, three days ahead already on her lightning goal or whatever. And it's the, 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 the response from the students has been like mind blowing because I think for a lot of them, it's like the first time in their entire academic career that they've been asked like, hey, here's the goals, here's what you need to accomplish, but like, how do you want to approach this? How do you want to allocate your time? And so I think that sort of like goal setting uh, structure is like very foundational to Primer. And then the other thing that's been cool is that for students, a lot of students that have been failed by the traditional system, they come to Primer. So we had like a third grader that came to Primer last year and he couldn't read. And he told his micro school leader, his micro school was asking, what are your goals for the year? And he said, my goal is to learn how to read. I'm sick of being made fun of, like I want to know how to read. And third grade is like the classic sort of chasm divide where like if you don't, if you can't read by the end, if you're not on grade level by the end of third grade, it's incredibly predictive of the rest of your academic career in terms of not just reading, but almost everything else. And so uh, the micro school leader said, all right, let's do it. And so she got him like one-on-one, -on -one, additional one-on-one -on -one remedial support. He spent hours a day working on reading. And in like 12 weeks, he went from like the first percentile in reading to like the 35th percentile in reading for his grade. And he was in the 99th percentile for growth in the United States. And he just like, you know, worked his butt off for those 12 weeks, but he made incredible progress. And it was super rewarding for him. His mom was like crying, talking about it. And it's like, we, I mean, I don't think we did anything that novel there. We just like asked him what he wanted his goals to be. And then we made sure we gave him everything he needed to hit those goals if he was willing to put in the work. And so I think for me, that's, you know, I don't, I don't feel like we're doing anything that, uh, you know, wild or innovative. I think it's all, it's, to me, it feels very basic, but I think it's, it's uh, pretty contrarian um, when you size it up against the experience of most academic experiences, especially for elementary and middle school. Yeah. I think I, I have a very similar opinion on most of the alternative schools that I see being built and like different models that are emerging. A lot of it very intuitive. When you, when you stop and you think from a first principles perspective about what yeah. education should be and what kids need to know and how you motivate a child and how you help a child build the skills that are then going to translate over to being an active agent in the adult world, not just listening to someone give them instructions. Like it's, it's fairly intuitive what needs to happen. It's just totally. that the legacy system's really bad at it. And so- yeah. The new schools that are emerging are seem wildly contrarian in comparison, but when you stop and think about it, it's they're really it it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, totally. So you grew up homeschooled, but your mom was also homeschooling other local kids, right? So it's kind of like she was running a micro school, if I understand the story correctly. Yeah, I mean, at that time they would call it like a homeschool co-op, mm -hmm. um, but it was like the same group of. I don't know, 11 kids or something that okay. basically for kindergarten through eighth grade, it, it sort of had varying permutations. But for kindergarten through eighth grade, those five families, I think, um, basically all, all of us, you know, did did school together. Um, and my mom was kind of the like, 
you know, ringleader of that, those, those families and kind of, um, you know, she was the one that had, you know, actual teaching experience because she was a public school teacher before this. Yeah. And so she, um, you know, she was the one that was kind of, I think, driving a lot of the, like how we approached different experiences that they wanted us to have or, um, and sometimes we would do different, you know, groups with our church or we would, you know, be part of other co-ops and things too. Um, but she was kind of the trailblazer that like, kind of, I think, figured it all out for everyone. Um, and at the time it was just kind of this, you know, there wasn't that many homeschoolers in Florida. Um, it wasn't like a popular thing. And so it was it was very contrarian for her to do. Like I remember she had, you know, there was family members that that disagreed with it and let her know how much they disagreed with it. Um, you know, people like friends and people at church and different things would think it was really weird. Um, so this was not like now where there's, you know, millions of homeschoolers in the U.S. Um, you know, there was probably like low tens of thousands of homeschoolers in Florida total at that point. Um, and so it was a very contrarian thing. But obviously I'm like insanely grateful that they you know, made that call and were willing to be contrarian um, to make that happen for us. Because we were zoned, I was zoned for a really bad, like an F-rated school. And that's where I would have been. And I would not be sitting here now talking to you if my parents hadn't made the sacrifices to, um, you know, to, to not have me go to that school and to create a better option. So what's your stance on homeschooling versus micro schools? Because this is a, like, there's a huge exodus of, from the public system in both directions. Lots of families yep. joining micro schools, lots of people homeschooling. Uh, people have a lot of different opinions on why one or the other is better. Some parents want to be really hands-on involved in their kids' education. They want their kids home all yep. day. Obviously, there's like the different pedagogical paradigms around what they want an education to be. Um, some people choose micro schools because it's convenient, because then both parents can continue working. Sometimes they choose a micro school because they want the kids to have you know the community factor. You kind of have been in both worlds, and obviously you're building a micro school network. How do you yep. think about the pros and cons of homeschooling versus micro schools? Or if you're like very bullish on micro schools and you're an advocate for that, what's your argument for? I think homeschooling is amazing. Um, I think homeschooling, I, I guess what I would say is homeschooling, it's very difficult for homeschooling to ever go truly mainstream. So I, what I'm interested in is building a true alternative for the, you know, call it the average American family. So primary micro schools are not, competing with the $50,000 a year private schools. We're not trying to build something that's slightly better for the kids that can already afford that. We're trying to build an experience that works for every family. So we have families that are extremely high income that come to Primer, and we have families that are extremely low income that come to Primer. And part of our goal is to create an operating model where the economics work for families across the spectrum. And I think that's the only way that you can make the size of impact that we want to make in the world. Um, I think homeschooling is incredible. And I think that for a lot of families, homeschooling is uh, at least an amazing option, if not the best option. The challenge with homeschooling is that there's this immovable barrier for it for most families, which is that one parent has to be home semi full time or full time. And the reality is for most families in the US, that's not possible, either because it's a single parent household, or because both families work, or because even if a, family, a parent doesn't work, there's um, you know some reason why they don't feel like they could homeschool well, or don't have the background, or don't have the ability to do it. And so I think homeschooling, my, my guess is that homeschooling continues to grow at some single digit percentage year over year. And that continues you know for many years. And I think that's a great thing for the world. Um, but, but I think it's, it'd be very difficult to imagine a world where, say, 15% or 20% of US families were homeschooling because of the other sort of structural challenges of homeschooling for families. And so that's why I think micro schools are amazing because you can get um, a lot of the same sort of uh, pedagogical approach, structure, um, you know, the feeling of sort of uh, someone really knowing your kid and personalizing the education experience to them um, while still getting, uh, you know, what most families need, which is just in practical terms, a place for their kid to go from eight to three every day so that they can go work uh, or do what they need to do. And so um, I think micro schools structurally have a huge advantage over homeschooling because of that. Um, but I think that for, you know, if you if you're a former teacher and you have the desire and the ability to homeschool your kid, I'm willing to bet nine out of 10 times, that's going to be the best option um, for your kids. Uh, but I think for most families, micro schooling is like the most accessible option um, and the one that's going to make the most sense and has the best chance of, of achieving a huge scale. I want to talk about your your point about the accessibility financially of the model, because this is one of the big areas that people really have a hard time with in the conversation about alternatives. It very quickly gets pushed in the direction of, well, that's just for people who have a lot of resources. Like you can fix yep. education for rich families and maybe upper middle yep. class families, but everybody else is just getting left behind. And I think that misses the core point 
of a lot of yep. the innovation that's happening, which is maybe it starts out expensive, but it becomes accessible very quickly. This is the, the story of innovation throughout history. You look at any new technology yep. or product, like the automobile was inaccessible to most people early on, but it very quickly became a household staple. Same with refrigeration, air conditioning, all of these different things that we've built technologically. And the same is true for education. We're just in the early stages of it. But you're also working really hard, as I understand, to make it your what you're doing right now accessible for families, even if they don't have tons of resources. And I'd love, I kind of want to dig into the higher level philosophical side yep. of this, like why the argument is flawed from the onset that this is just for rich families, but also what you're actually doing to make yep. it accessible right now to families, no matter what income bracket they're in. Yep. Um, yeah, I have a bunch of thoughts. So um, we, I mean, so yeah, I think that the primary success to me will be defined by the number of families that are able to uh, send their kids to primary times the magnitude of impact we can have on those families. And so um, we are we are obsessed with figuring out how to make this as accessible as possible for families. Um, the reality is the traditional school system just wastes lots of money. Um, I don't think any very few people would disagree with that. Um, there's an enormous amount of of money being spent on, and it's not just the school system; it's almost every industry. But administrative bloat, bureaucratic bloat, sort of like layers and layers of management, uh, consultants, all these like processes, and uh, I don't even think all of it is like you know, sort of with ill intention, a lot of it is probably like the people that were behind those dis individual decisions had good reasons for them. But when you add up 50 of those decisions, you get to this point where it's just like suffocating for uh, the teachers. And so our model is really like you strip out everything and you say, hey, we're going to have a great teacher. We're going to use existing real estate. Um, so we're going to use, you know, a community center, a library, a church, a religious, you know, whatever existing real estate that's underutilized from Monday through Friday. It's going to be really high quality space. It's going to feel like, you know, sort of a world class learning experience, but it is going to be existing real estate. We're not going to go build huge schools. Um, and most of our, like our primary Input, cost input is the labor is is the micro school leaders themselves, and so most of the money, uh, you know, the, by far the largest percentage of our cost is the, is the money from tuition going to the micro school leaders, and so micro school leaders with primary end up making forty percent more than they would make in their traditional. Well, many of them are coming from the traditional system, but if they weren't, the sort of district equivalent salary they would make, they make forty percent more at primary. So um, when you strip all that out, you end up with teachers making more money. You can have the, the overall operating costs of the school itself is much lower on a per student basis, um, and so we're able to deliver, I think, a, a much better uh, education. But even if you just believed it was comparable to the public school system, we're able to do that at, depending on the district, 30, 40, 50 percent less than what the, the public school system is doing it at. Um, and so I think there's just there's so many so like the, the micro school model has so many structural advantages. Um, the challenge, I would say, is that the things that you mentioned, uh, while I agree directionally, most of the things that you mentioned were primarily pure play tech uh, you know, in, innovation. So it was, it was pure play technology where, mm -hmm. and technology is deflationary. And so, um, you know, you go from the first, you go from a hundred, you know, cars being made to a hundred thousand and then a hundred million. And there's going to be like huge economies of scale. The challenge for education is that the primary input, uh, or, or for most education experiences, the primary two inputs are real estate and labor. And so, and those two things are not, technology doesn't make those two things deflationary, at least uh, sort of on a, a sort of to a first approximation of the, the, the initial experience. So there's a lot of things that we're doing, which are trying to help augment the experience of a micro school leader to make the micro school, the experience of leading a school at primer way easier and way more intuitive um, with, with what feels like way more support than you would have in a traditional classroom. Um, and we use technology to do that. So there's things that we can do, I think, to, um, you know, both improve the out student outcomes while also improving the micro school leader experience through technology. Um, and there's things strategically we can do, like using underutilized real estate that reduce the real estate costs. Um, but there's that, that's going to asymptote to some, you know, level that will be hard to uh, decrease much further. And so, that's kind of why we're so obsessed with this idea of helping find great teachers to launch micro schools because that that structure we believe has such an advantage from a cost perspective over anything else. Um, and then we spend all of our energy making the experience for them as great as possible and the experience for families as great as possible. And then we can obsess over those two things, the micro school leader sort of in the driver's seat launching the school. Um, and we just have a lot of conviction in that model. What do you see as being the long play for making 
the model that you're building accessible to every family in America? Like what levers have to get pulled or what needs to move or change for any family in America to be able to say, primer seems like the best option for my kid and this is actually a realistic play for us? Um, I mean, the incumbents are very good at staying incumbents. So they're incumbents for a reason. Um, and there's, it's not a coincidence. Uh, you know, it's not for lack of effort that uh, there hasn't been, you know, major disruption in education and innovation in education. Um, a lot of people have tried. It's just very, very hard. So I think that's uh, the biggest thing is, is you have to figure out a model that can actually scale structurally. And if you think about um, a lot of the sort of noteworthy people that have tried to, to scale other models, the models themselves were structurally flawed. Either they had super high capex, um, they had regulatory, like sort of insurmountable regulatory challenges. Um, there's a, you know, it could diagnose all sorts of different, different reasons, but there was these structural problems with the model that made it very, very difficult to scale to, to beyond maybe 1,000 students or 2,000 students. And so if you wanted to build something that 10 years from now could have millions of students in that model, you have to pick something that one is something that 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 from a parent perspective delivers an experience that that they want, but then two does that at a, at a sort of uh, an, a, 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 an operating profile that can be both relatively cheap from an expansion perspective, but also relatively cheap from an operating perspective, so that families can afford it. And so that's again why the micro school model to me has such structural advantages that the, from an expansion perspective you can expand so much faster and so much easier because you can use underutilized existing real estate rather than having to go acquire these you know huge school buildings buildings or try to build new school buildings or whatever. Um, so I think those are the two, the two biggest things. And so we, we think a lot about, um, you know, how can we be great partners uh, to, uh, to, to people that, that from a regulatory perspective, like make sure that we're working closely with them, um, make sure that we're, um, you know, thinking about from, from an expansion perspective, how can we empower micro school leaders to be in the driver's seat of expansion as much as possible? Um, so we have micro school leaders that will reach out like, oh, my friend wants to launch a micro school in Jacksonville or like Fort Lauderdale or Fort Myers next year. Um, and we're like, awesome, let's talk about it. And so um, that's the engine that we want to figure out how to kickstart and scale. It's not primer top down, okay, primer is going to go do this and then like, you know, Know, hope we can find some micro school leaders. It's really micro school leader first and then primer following them. But there's still a financial barrier for a lot of families. Like a lot of families flat out don't have resources to put into a private education. Yep. Uh, they're already paying, if, they're, if they own property, they're paying property taxes into their local school. And that's, you know, as much financial burden as they can carry for education. Yep. So what needs to happen or like that, that, that still means that, you know, you have to be above a certain income threshold in order to afford any alternative program. So yep. what, what makes education accessible to literally everybody? Is it school choice legislation being passed in every state? Are there other avenues that can open up scholarship programs without having to rely on the government passing bills that they're maybe not incentivized to pass in a lot of places? Like what, what do you see as being the highest leverage points for that? Yeah, we, so we take, our approach is really to whatever, whatever uh, funding is available for a given family. We, we've built kind of an engine to help, like to give them the best chance possible of securing that funding. And so, um, we will work with, we, we will basically on behalf of families, help them get access to every dollar they have access to, whether that's a tax credit scholarship, whether that's an ESA. Um, we also have our own foundation where we raise money for that we, that we then are able to use for things like um, school supplies or meals or things that fa families need that might not be sort of, um, you know, wouldn't be supplied by a traditional private school. Um, and so our, my, my, our model is basically, we want to help families. Like a lot of these programs are very convoluted to access. And so if you're in a state that has a tax credit scholarship or in a state that has an ESA, um, you know, there's, it's actually like once that passes or once that's live, it can still be really difficult to access that. And so um, we try to make it really easy and simple for families to be able to act like, A, make them aware of what the programs are that they qualify for. So when they apply for financial aid at Primer, we'll say, okay, you qualify for this, 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 and this. Here's how you can go apply for those things. You should go do that and then come back to us. Um, we might say, hey, the Primer Foundation will also award you X level of scholarship this year. Um, and, you know, here's what that scholarship, those dollars are going to use for. Maybe some of it's for tuition, some of it's for, um, you know, for school supplies, some of it's for meals, whatever. Um, 
And so our approach is to kind of work with everybody and whatever whatever is available to that family, we want to make available to them. I think certainly the structural, uh, at, at, on a state level, the structural sort of um, thing that's happening where families are able to get this property tax money that they're paying in most states um, back if they opt out of the public school system, structurally that is, I think, what will that will become kind of the defining um, state level legislation that, that most, I think families will actually make decisions on where they move based on that. Um, and that we're seeing that play out already. Um, and so that I think is probably the, the biggest lever, but I think that, that there's too many people banking on that or too many, there's, there's a lot of, um, models that are too predicated on that. And so we, you know, we'll work with all those programs, but we also want to figure out how to help families regardless of where they live or what they qualify for. That's one of the things that I'm particularly excited about with what you're building is the level of pulse that you have or finger on the pulse that you have on the the economic side of things. There is like a, the once you start going down the rabbit hole of alternative education, you start talking to people who've gone deep in the weeds on like a state level and a federal level with funding. There's lots of money out there mm-hmm. that's available for parents to fund an alternative education for their kids. Like pff, a lot of families have a lot of money potentially on the table that they just don't know about. But there's a yep. huge access problem because it's so hard. It's almost like they they make the money available, but they don't actually want you to use it. Like they make it incredibly hard to find and and utilize. And so the fact that you're systematizing making that accessible is really exciting to me because that's one of the huge problems to address. It's like how how do we make it as easy as possible to navigate the bureaucracy and just like streamline people's ability to find. Yep. alternatives. And I think you're doing that across the board. You're doing that on the family side where you're helping parents find financial resources to fund the education. You're also doing it on the teacher side of things. There are so many disgruntled teachers out there who are looking to exit yep. the system. I talk to a lot of them on Twitter on a daily basis. The number is high. And it's yep. really hard to exit because, like you said, the incumbents are really good at staying incumbents. They're, they make it very difficult for competition to come yeah. along, which is a whole rabbit hole. Maybe we'll get into in a little bit, the competition and free market side of things. But they make it really difficult for teachers to go start their own thing. It's hard for them to be entrepreneurial, even if they're very entrepreneurial in spirit, which a lot of them yeah. are. And you're trying to take as much of the friction away on both sides of this equation and just be like, hey, look, we'll we'll systematize all this hard stuff. Yep. And then you can just go do the thing that you're actually really good at, which is for parents, like knowing what's the best option for your kid. Like you, parents know best what their kids yep. need. And for teachers, like delivering an amazing education for their kids. And you're doing, you're tackling both of those in a way that just like you're blazing the trail. And then you're saying, hey, look, parents, teachers, this is like, there is a path here, which I yep. think is the biggest friction point on both sides for people to be able to take action here. So I love I love the way that you think about both sides of this. I think it's really important. And I think, you know, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit. We've talked some about the parent side of things. I'd love to hear you talk about the teacher side of things too. Like where, yeah. what some of these biz- biggest friction points are that you're alleviating for teachers or taking off of their plate to allow them to actually start a micro school, even if they're not super savvy at like the business side of things or the bureaucracy side of things. Yeah, one of the things that's crazy, you mentioned teachers wanting to quit their jobs. I think people um, sort of misunderstand that that narrative or that that, that data. Um, I think McKinsey put out a report that one third of teachers last year, like one, either contemplated or tried to quit their jobs. Um, and I think what's interesting about it is that at least what I hear anecdotally is that teachers actually don't want to leave teaching. They don't want to stop teaching. No. They just don't like teaching in the current sort of traditional system because. Um, you, you know, depending on the teacher, you're going to have all sorts of different reasons for that. But um, they love the like interacting with kids, being responsible for kids, academic growth, teaching kids, building relationships with parents, like all that stuff they love. It's everything else that makes them want to quit. And so we, I, I find that to be fascinating because the mo- like primers model in a lot of ways is just stripping all that other stuff out and then allowing teachers to focus on what they do best and what, what most of them really love and find extremely motivating. And so um, I think it's interesting, you know, there's obviously like the, the, there's a lot of hand wringing and frustration or whatever, lots of emotions about the stats about teachers quitting, but I actually think it's not teachers that want to leave the profession entirely. And I think that distinction is really important. Um, what we find is that the, the teachers that we look for at Primer, there's three things that we look for. So one is um, 
the, the base level is just like core academics. Like, are they you know going to be able to be a great academic partner for the growth of these students? And that's sort of like a you know sort of a checkbox. Like we that's the base level thing that we need. And if you don't have that, like you're not going to advance. But we sort of assume that we can find teachers for that. The second is the sort of entrepreneurial spirit of like because they're, they're really starting like their own kind of like small operation or small organization that they're really starting in the form of a school. And so they need to have that kind of like entrepreneurial DNA and drive. And then the third, um, which is actually the hardest to find, is we we uh, when I interview them, I'll give them an example and I'll say, hey, um, let's assume that you have a student that is really into um, NFL statistics and they want, you know, uh, you have a, a third grade girl who really wants to be like, an, and she wants to work on like an NFL team. And she's like obsessed with the NFL draft and everything. Um, you have two hours a day uh, in the afternoon where this kid can go deep on that that passion, that interest. And, then she, and she's like so dead set on it. It's like absolutely what she wants to do. Like she's just obsessed with it. What would you do? And 90% of teachers, even really good teachers, they would they, their response would be like, well, I'd have her do some research and then I'd have her get a trifold board and then I'd have her like, you know, do a like report and she would spend like, you know, three weeks on it and then we'd have like a parent event and we'd have her present with other students about like what she learned about like being an NFL statistician. 10% of teachers and the 10% that we look for will say, oh, I would email the Jacksonville Jaguars or the Miami Dolphins or the Arizona Cardinals. And I would say, hey, we have this third grader. She's amazing. She's worked for the last eight weeks on an analysis of your upcoming NFL draft. And she would love to present it to someone on your team and get feedback from it. And even better, she'd love to intern with you for a day. Is there any way that she could come be like an intern and learn what it's like to work with your stats team and your data science team to analyze and talk about the upcoming draft and how you are thinking about allocating your draft picks? And those are the teachers that we want at Primer, who think totally outside the box and who aren't thinking in the confines of like the traditional system because our structure allows us for kids to go do those things. And we've had so many moments with kids where like they, you see some spark, you see something they're excited about. And then we sort of like take that, we like, we like pour gas on it and we take it like 10 X and they, it's like their, their, their minds are blown. Like they've never had anyone take this sort of like spark and really try to kindle it and try to see like, Hey, how big can we make this? And so that's actually the hardest thing to find. Um, and so if you are a teacher that thinks like that, I would love to talk to you. Um, but I think that that, that is like the defining part of primer is if you can imagine an education network where every teacher thinks like that and is obsessed with unlocking those kind of opportunities for students, that's what I think 10 years from now, hopefully, that is like the defining thing that makes Primer different. And it's very, very hard to find teachers that think that way. Um, but when you do, like you can you can change kids' lives forever um, just from those small interactions. So that's kind of like what we obsess over. What's the relationship between the level of structure that you're giving teachers coming into Primer versus their level of agency in being able to design an education for their kids? As you mentioned earlier, like you have a set of curricular expectations that are organization consistent, but yep. these schools are also operating as independent micro schools to some extent. It sounds like it's a very a teach, teacher up, not primer down model. Yep. So how do you, how much structure do you give teachers versus how much are they designing the education based on their own values and the needs of their students in their individual classroom? Yeah, so we... Uh, we try to find a healthy balance between those two things. So um, on core academics, we are pretty prescriptive over what we expect. Um, we we spend a lot of time, like Lindsay, who's our um, the kind of head of academics, she spends a lot of time on it's like research back. Like she she's really trying to figure out what is the optimal pedagogy for the kids that we're serving, um, like both for like remedial and kids that are on grade level. And so we're pretty prescriptive on the core academics. They, the micro school leaders have some um, ability to customize things. They can decide, you know, okay, this, you know, I want to teach this this way, different things like that. But for the most part, in terms of the curriculum and the academic structure, we're pretty prescriptive. For the afternoon time and the time where kids can go deep on the things they're excited about, that's where um, micro school leaders have a lot of autonomy. And students also obviously have a lot of autonomy. And so we have micro school leaders who will say, hey, I want to run a robotics lab for my students. And I'm like super passionate about robotics. And so I want to spend an hour of the afternoon doing a robotics lab. And the other hour, you know, um, the students can work on other projects. And all the students really bought it and excited about it. And we're like, awesome, like sweet. Like that's so cool. Like here's the budget for it. Have a blast. Um, we have other micro school leaders that want to do like language immersion or there's all, you know, whatever they're excited about. 
And so as long as the kids are bought in and the families are bought in, we want the micro school leaders and we trust them to make those decisions and to create great experiences for the kids. We still like the kids to have some time that's not prescriptive. So even if an hour of the afternoon is like the micro school leader doing something that they're sort of like leading for the class that they're passionate about the sort of off the books of primer, um, we still want them to have some amount of time each week that they can spend writing a book or learning about marine biology or whatever they're excited about. Um, but the micro school leaders have a lot of say in that. And then there's all these sort of like softer, um, you know, how do transitions work? How does opening circle work in elementary school? Like that kind of stuff that micro school leaders have a lot of agency over. Um, and so we try to like, we think of it as a spectrum of like uh, sort of agency versus support. And so like we want for a lot of the experience that we want them to feel very supported. Like they have a bunch of resources behind them. They have a team behind them that cares about them, that wants them to be successful as teachers, as micro school leaders, but then also them having a lot of agency. And so the support sort of like, you know, holds out the places where they have agency. And, and there's obviously that's not going to be evenly distributed across the whole experience. But um, we want micro schoolers to feel like, hey, I've got agency over some important things that are important to me, but I also have support and structure that helps me be successful without putting everything on me and feeling like I'm actually starting a school from scratch with like no help and no resources. You also talked about, you've mentioned technology a couple times as something you guys are using to leverage both teachers' time and capacity and also the yep. capacity of Primer. What types of tech are you using? Are you building things? Are you using existing tools? What does that look like? So the whole uh, student, parent, and teacher experience is all built in-house. Um, so we do integrate with third-party apps, so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel on everything. So if a kid wants to use Khan Academy or if a kid's using Alexia or Admintum or pick your education app, um, we do integrate with all those and we pull in data from them. Um, but the the core experience, like the student homepage, the teacher homepage, the family homepage, all that is is, is in-house by Primer. Um, and we do a lot of small things that I think the, the goal is to make it feel different than a traditional kind of school experience. So for example, students, when they join Primer, they take this survey of what are things that they're excited about, what motivates them. And so they, it could be um, you know, things like building games in Roblox or Minecraft. It could be ballet. It could be um, outdoors, hiking. It could be sports, whatever. Anything that just makes them excited and motivates them. And then uh, as like a small example, we take every academic milestone and when they look at that milestone, they can see the sort of like textbook definition, which might be, um, you know, like divide numbers, divide two digit numbers or something. Um, and then they can also see um, a, a, a definition that we use uh, GPT, we use OpenAI to, to basically uh, translate that milestone into some context that makes them, that makes sense to them. And so when they're about to learn about, you know, uh, two digit division, uh, maybe a kid that's really into coding. He'll see like, oh, I'm going to learn two digits, but they'll also see like, oh, there's like these three or four, uh, you know, programming things. Or if you're working on these problems, you would need to know how to do two-digit division, and this would help you actually help you be more effective. And so, I mean, there'll be specific examples. And so, um, there's a lot of small things like that where we like, there's just no existing product that does that. And so, we need to own the product experience end to end in order to, I think, create the experience we want for kids and for families. Um, but then we do, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. So, like I said, we integrate with a lot of third-party apps too. How much of the academic side of things is using third-party apps versus being teacher-driven? Like, are teachers able to free up a lot of their time by having kids get their primary mathematics instruction from something like Khan Academy instead of the teacher having to be the one conveying everything to them? Or is it more of a traditional, like the teacher is the primary one handling the instruction? Or does it vary from school to school? So it varies based on grade level. So like K through two, for example, is almost exclusively in person, zero uh, apps or uh, like sort of digital experiences. Um, so lots of manipulatives, not substation based kind of rotations with a micro school leader and a studio guide. Um, and then as the kids get older, we introduce different tech experiences for them. And so um, it depends a lot on if the kid is, if a given student is needs remedial support or if they're on grade level or ahead. Um, but it'll be a combination of micro school leader instruction. So this is kind of like how you would sort of picture in a micro school or a micro school leader and a studio guide or teaching kids some concept and talking about it and doing a discussion or whatever, um, combined with um, different applications that we would ask the kids to use if they need specific either support or they're learning a specific concept that we think they're really, maybe Khan Academy is really great at teaching this specific thing or Alexia or whatever. Um, and then there's also virtual teachers and virtual tutoring. So kids that need remedial support or kids that we want in specific classes, they can take virtual classes as well. And so the powerful thing about this is that it 
means that the micro school leader doesn't have to be an expert in everything. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a lot, especially as the kids get older, having a single micro school leader that's responsible for the academic progress of every single student across every subject is a lot, especially if you're talking about seventh, eighth grade. And so the virtual courses, as they ramp up, allow micro school leaders to sort of lean into what they're really good at and talented at, but then also have support where they don't, if they're not the, you know, the world's greatest science teacher or math teacher, they don't have, the kids aren't then beholden to the quality of their teaching for every single subject. Um, and so the time that kids spend on apps or in, in digital stuff kind of depends on the student, it depends on the school, depends on the age. Um, but we, the in-person experience is like a huge part of it. And so it's definitely not, we definitely don't want it to be ex an experience for kids where they're just sitting on apps all day long, certainly not at the younger ages, but even for older ages too. Um, and so it kind of depends on the micro school leader and the age. Yeah, I think one of the things that excites me about micro schools, and I've heard, I've had different people on the show who have talked about micro schools in different capacities. They're either building them, they're advocates for them. There's a lot of diff different definitions about what they are. Yep. Uh, some people consider their 150 kid school a micro school, and other people are like, no, if it's double digits, it's not a micro school anymore. Um, but I've heard people describe it as a 21st uh, or a one room schoolhouse for the 21st century, which yep. I think is an interesting anchor point for people because it gives us some historical context. And I think the, the historical context is actually really important because we had this long cycle of, uh, of expansion in the size yep. of our schools. And it was valuable for a point in history where we didn't have free access to information. So the more you consolidate, the more you bring under one roof, the more resources kids have access to. Like you can have yeah. a robotics club at your school or a music club at your school because you have enough kids who are interested in that you can bring in a teacher for it that you never could have had in a historical one-room schoolhouse. Yep. But we have technology now in a way that I think schools, most school does a terrible job utilizing. Um, we, we use technology very little for the amount of power we have at our fingertips inside of the legacy system. Yep. And yet, if you have the the one-room schoolhouse idea in the internet age, you're kind of getting the best of both worlds where you can have the super plugged-in, personalized attention with the kids, but you can also have access to the best math teachers in the world or the best history teachers in the world or like whatever things the kids are interested in, they can plug into yep. in, inside of the context of their still like very personalized education that they're getting. And so I'm really excited to see different models emerging that are really leveraging that. And this is a very open-ended question, but I'm really curious how you think about technology and its relationship to the future of education and some of the possibilities that exist, especially now that we have AI, which is going to make, we haven't even scratched the surface of what that's going to empower inside of education. And I don't think the legacy system is probably going to do a lot to innovate inside of technology just based on how much the system has changed since the advent of the internet and how, how little it's changed the structure of what it does. But I'm really curious what you're seeing or what you're excited about that technology is going to empower. Yeah. I think... Um... There's, there's a couple buckets. So on the on the virtual sort of technology versus in-person, I think that the, there's a bit of like a false binary that people set up where it's mm -hmm. like, oh, in-person teaching is better than virtual teaching. And then that's sort of like the end of the debate. And it's much more nuanced than that, from my view. I think that uh, obviously the best experience for a kid would be a world-class teacher in a given subject in person with them, ideally one-on-one, -on -one, um, but the smallest possible group. Like, I don't think anyone disagrees with that. The problem is that for most students, the person that happens to be their fifth grade teacher in most schools doesn't happen to be, isn't, isn't actually world class at every subject. Maybe they're really good at one thing, but they're not good at everything. And so in my view, it's much better to have a, an, an excellent teacher virtually than a 40th percentile math teacher in person. And you could debate where exactly the sort of like trade off that curve is and at which point it's better, you know, whatever. But the point being, like, I think most people would agree with that. And so for our, the way we think about it is like, hey, if we can source these really great, excellent virtual teachers for specific subjects to supplement micro school leaders, that's an obviously better experience to have what I would think is like a 95 or 95th percentile teacher um, teaching math to a fifth grader is way better than their micro school leader who might be really good at a bunch of other stuff, but is not that great at teaching math. And so that to me is like, uh, it's a bit of like a false binary that gets set up. And I think COVID like 
really soured people on virtual like virtual school in a way that is probably like a pretty big overreaction now. And so we think there's like a way to get the best of both worlds and have um, really great, really strong academic teachers virtually with, a, I think, a really great student experience that supplement in-person teachers. As far as technology as a whole, I think the thing we're most excited about is just the personalization aspect, which is not in, a novel idea. Um, but there's, it's just wild what you can do when kids feel like they are not just part of this sort of like industrial assembly line that is like completely devoid of any personal, you know, their, their personal agency or personhood and they're just sort of like a number. Um, and when you shift it to them really feeling like, hey, this is like a, we actually like built a lot of stuff like to, to, to like really personalize this to you and we care about like you, James, the student and like here's your dashboard and where you're at and we, our plan for you and the plan that you were down with your teacher and um, so that's the stuff that I think is most exciting. I mean, the, the, I, I'm, I'm pretty bearish on AI replacing teachers, um, especially in the context of like primer micro schools or micro schools in general. Um, I think there's a lot of things that will be really exciting and things like grading projects, things like um, specific conversational teaching of like specific concepts. Um, but the in-person, like I'm a very, very strong believer that if you're a fifth grade student, you need to walk in to wherever you're educating, whether it's your parent or whether it's a micro school leader or your teacher, to someone who knows you, who loves you, who if your dog dies is going to give you a hug and is going to know your dog's name um, and you know write a letter to you to check in, um, who's going to know your parents, who know your family situation, um, who's going to bring you a meal, you know, if you get sick, like that, that is an important part in my view, um, of a child's education experience. And you need a human, ideally an exceptional human that has, you know, strong morals and the type of person that you would want leading your kid on the other side of that. And so, um, I think that te technology, what we're excited about is all the ways technology can empower those people to be more effective, to get more of them teaching students, have them be able to teach more students, um, and that's where we get really excited, but we're not, uh, I, I think that that is like the, the, the human experience to me is like an essential part of this. Um, and AI and technology will be, do a lot of really cool things, um, like sort of surrounding that and orbiting that experience, but that will always be like the key part of the primary experience. I love that. And I agree completely. If you're teaching kids how to interface with the world, it's we're living in a human centric world. So they have to learn how to interact with humans and having people like the experience that you just described of a, a teacher who's not only caring about them and, and encouraging them to learn because they care, but also modeling what good yep. human experiences look like is incredibly important. What is the average size of one of your primary classrooms and what is the age split? Like, is it is every classroom like the full K through six or K through eight spectrum or are they divided into smaller groups? What does the structure look like? So typically it's a max of three grades in one class. So you might have K through two in one micro school, three through five in one micro school, six through eight in one micro school. Um, optimally, it's more like two grades. We do, we're big believers in mixed age classrooms in mixed age micro schools. And so that's not something we shy away from. There's a lot of research backing that up. Um, and so we do like the, the mixed age environments. Uh, the average micro school is um, probably 24, 25 kids. Uh, it depends on the micro school leader, the, the age of the kids. So at younger ages, there's fewer kids. Um, at older ages, there'll be more kids per micro school. Um, it depends a lot on the micro schooler's comfort level, how many students they want to have in their micro school. Do they have a studio guide? Um, and so past like 18, for, for the older kids, past like 16, 17, 18 students, they typically have a studio guide um, that comes in and helps them that they can hire to help run the school. And they sort of have like two you know, teachers or two adults that are in the, in the micro school. Um, and that allows them to support, you know, even a micro school with like 28 kids, you can still deliver a really great experience especially when most public schools have that number of kids with one teacher and no aid or no, no guide. Um, so it depends a lot on the, the geography and the, the market and the classroom and all that, but that's kind of the average across the board. And where are you guys currently located? Because you're not, you have specific markets that you're expanding into, if I understand correctly. Yes, yeah, so we have, um, we have micro schools in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Jacksonville, and Florida. And then... Um, we have micro schools in the greater Phoenix area and Scottsdale and Tempe. Um, and we'll be expanding more next year. We launched 23 new micro schools uh, in August of this year. And then we'll be expanding a lot more next year. Um, so yeah, if you, uh, if you have kids or friends that are in those markets, we'd love to have them join Primer or teachers that want to launch micro schools. We'd love to talk to them. Why Arizona and Florida? Is it because they're more school choice friendly? Are there, were there big markets there that you 
knew you'd be able to tap into? Did you just have the teachers there to start? Why were those your targets? Yeah, it's a combination. So I grew up in Florida, um, and so we and we had a strong network. Um, someone on our team, Ian Bravo, was kind of our head of schools. He um, he had a a network of teachers that were like ready to go and excited about micro schools, and so um, that was probably the primary driver. Because again, our model is so micro school leader centric, and so having you know, four or five really great micro school leaders that want to be like the first ones out of the gate. It was huge. Um, and then it's also, uh, I think, states that are generally forward thinking on education. They're pro new schools, pro, you know, innovation in education. Um, and so from a regulatory perspective, that side of it was um, easier or easy, easier than it would have been in other states. Maybe it still wasn't easy, um, but it was easier than it would have been. Um, and so I think a combination, a combination of those things. And they're also just, you know, both states have a huge migration of families to the, to those states. And so from a population growth perspective, you have, um, you know, population growth creates overcrowded schools, which creates families looking for alternatives. Um, and so both both states and, and the cities we're in um, are growing extremely quickly. And so they they need more school options. So people like, you know, the mayor and um, the local legislation, and all, all legislators are all very excited about, um, you know, new schools coming. And so there's, it's much easier to build kind of like a groundswell of support behind you when it's like the sort of really dire need for the city. Are you talking publicly about your growth roadmap from here? Or is that still under wraps? Can I ask you about like where where you want to expand into next? We haven't announced anything. I mean, there's a lot of great work to be done just in Florida and Arizona. So I think um, we're very excited about both of those markets. There's other states, um, kind of the usual suspects that we're excited about, Texas, Utah, um, Indiana, um, that, that I'm excited to get to. And uh, there's a lot of families that have asked for primer. We have families probably from almost every state that have written in and asked us to you know, launch schools in their, in their state or their city. Um, but I, we also want to be really thoughtful about expansion and growth. Like education is you know, you can think of it, uh, obviously, like we're a startup, we, you know, we want to grow really quickly. And that's a core, key part of, you know, what we're doing and what we're, what our goals are. But the stakes, you know, it's not just users, it's kids and ed- kids education specifically, which is a, you know, one of the most impactful parts of their life. And so um, we want to be thoughtful about how we expand when we expand um, and making sure we're, we're not compromising quality in the name of expansion. And so um, I feel really good about our growth plans um, right now. And we'll, we'll probably announce new states um, either in the next few months or early next year. What about long-term vision for Primer? Like you've alluded a couple of times to the fact that you want this to be a huge organization that makes a, a meaningful stab at competing directly with the public school behemoth monopoly, which right now is, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of students in America are in public yep. schools. And there are a lot of people who are, both families exiting the system, entrepreneurs building other options. Like there's definitely a really meaningful shift that's happening, but it's still a very, very small subset of kids in America that are actively in an alternative program. What is the long-term vision of what you want to build? Yeah, I mean, I think my view is that if you look at the current education system in the U.S., we are failing generation after generation of kids. And... You can diagnose the problem however you want. You can chalk it up to politics. You can chalk it up to bureaucracy. You can chalk it up to, as far as I'm concerned, that's all sort of like irrelevant. Um, uh, you know, it would be great if public schools in the U.S. were awesome and were serving the needs of families, but well, they're not. And so uh, I think this is like a five alarm fire right now that we are, um, I, I think we have, it's like a, we talk about internally as like a civilizationally important problem. Like fixing this uh, is of, importance to humanity, importance to the United States, importance to these families. And so, yeah, I mean, our goal is to be a ubiquitous option for families in the United States um, and not just the wealthy families, not just the families that can afford other options, but to really find ways to make this affordable for every family. Um, and we're very direct about that. We're, we're maniacal about operating costs and figuring out how to do things as efficient as possible, and we will continue to be, because that's the only way to achieve our goal. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I mean, there's, you know, tens of millions of kids, 60, 70 million kids, depending on what grades you count that are being failed every year, um, by the traditional system. And, um, I think that that's, you know, we sort of, we've sort of all implicitly accepted that by the fact that none of us are doing anything about it. And I think that's, uh, 
it's just tragic. And so, um, yeah, I feel a lot of urgency to figure out how to get Primer um, and things like Primer. There's other, you know, great models that are being scaled too, but um, get Primer to as many families as possible, as quickly as possible, um, you know, while still being responsible about growth. So, yeah, the goal is the goal is to uh, hopefully spend, you know, many decades working on this um, and to make this an option that um, ideally 80, 90% of families in America, certainly in major markets, have access to. Do you have a hypothesis for why we have, we've done such a bad job working in the education space in America? Because I obviously, I mean, you know what I do for a living. I care very much about this problem and I too consider it to be of the utmost importance. I can't think of anything more important to be talking about than the problems in education and the the things that are available to fix them for individual families. But it feels like in a lot of ways it's not like people don't have a huge sense of urgency around it and there's not nearly as much competition in the market trying to build alternatives than one might expect when one starts to look into the enormity of the problem and the enormous opportunities that come along with a huge problem if you can get it right. Is it primarily a regulatory issue? Is it an apathy issue? Like do people just not care enough? Is it not something that's being talked about enough for people to even realize the severity of the problem? Or do you feel like there's a lot of urgency in the space and it's more, it's just really hard to do something? I have my own hypotheses about this, but I'm really curious, like you're deep in the weeds on it. What are you seeing? Yeah. I think there's three components. The first is that it's become political. And so um, saying things like we need to fix our public school system or our public school system is failing our kids I think these are objective statements that are backed up in data that someone of any political persuasion could say, could mean, and and would be very sensible to care about. Unfortunately, that's become politicized. And so, um, you know, any any substantive conversation about this quickly moves to politics, uh, which I think is sort of extremely suboptimal for, uh, you know, problems that you want people to solve just on their merits or just from kind of first principles. Two, uh, the incentive structure is just totally upside down. And so you can look at it from like a classroom basis. Um, teachers are not incentivized to raise the ceiling for kids. They're not incentivized to help kids get ahead. They're incentivized to focus almost exclusively on the floor um, to make sure that it's, it's all about kids on grade level. And so they're going to spend all their time getting the, as many kids up to grade level as possible. Um, the incentives on a per school basis are also totally upside down. Um, you know, people rarely get fired at the administrative level for poor performance. Um, schools that aren't doing well get more money. And so the incentives on the school level are totally upside down. Um, and so you can, I mean, this is like the classic, uh, you know, Charlie Munger quote, like, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. The incentives in education are just completely upside down right now. And then finally, I think people totally underestimate, uh, you know, people talk about regulation in education and they, they totally underestimate how much of the rest of, um, it's not just like the education regulation, it's all this other stuff that, that, that has been very carefully architected to make it extremely difficult to compete. And so this is stuff like land use, um, local zoning, um, you know, different types of approvals that are required to launch schools from a state and local level. Um, these are things that are, they don't, you don't think of it as like education regulation. You don't think of it as like a Department of Education policy. Um, but they're very carefully engineered to ensure that it is extremely difficult. Uh, and in some states, almost impossible uh, right now, though we're changing that, to launch new schools. Um, and that, that I think is something that is sort of very misunderstood is you can, um, you know, there's all sorts of emphasis on things like school choice and funding and making it easy for kids to attend schools outside of the district. Um, it's all great. We're not, you know, not like opposed to any of those things. Um, but when the rubber meets the road, it's like, hey, if you're a teacher and you have an idea for an awesome school, can you actually get that school off the ground and serve families in your neighborhood that you know and love uh, legally um, and operate? And in a lot of cities in the US, the answer to that is like, yes, but you need to have a couple hundred thousand dollars for lobbyists and lawyers, and you need to probably have two years of your life to give to try to get this thing off the ground. And I think that's insane. Um, and so none of these things are accidents. Um, none of these things are just, um, you know, coincidences. And I think that it's a, it's sort of a, a very uh, underrated part of this whole equation um, and something that we desperately need to fix and Primer is working on fixing and has already made a lot of progress on at the state level in some states. Um, but you know, desperately needs to be fixed, not just for, for what we're doing, but for anyone who wants to try to build better options for families. 
How do you think about inverting the incentive structure in the schools that you're building? Like what, what is, and not just for you too, but on like more of a meta level, what should the incentive structures be for education as a whole? And then how are you implementing them into the network that you're building? I have this idea that I would love to fund. Um, I was actually talking with a school district uh, about this, a uh, fairly large school district too, um, which is, could you fund a, could you privately fund a different compensation plan for teachers and administrators for mm -hmm. a year or two and carefully craft a set of very aggressive bonuses and incentive-based pay um, for different outcomes that you wanted to test. And you could do it at a per school level, you could do it at a district level. Um, and basic, it, the general framework would be like, um, you know, invert sort of like the, rather than focusing so much on the floor, focus on the ceiling um, and have, you know, teachers not as worried about this idea of like, you know, I gotta give every kid on grade level, things like that. Um, and they were actually really excited about it. And I think for like a lot of these districts, if you, you put five or 10 million bucks, you could probably create a really, for like two or three years, you could probably create a, a really exciting program for teachers and administrators. Um, so I would love to run that test at some point because I, I'm pretty convinced that the current, I mean, if you talk to teachers, like their incentive structure, A, there's like basically no incentive, like financial incentive for them to create any sort of outcome. It's all just like basically flat pay. And then, you know, you get a, a, a progression, like salary progression every year that whatever the unions negotiated. Um, there's very little incentive for like specific outcomes to happen. In many cases, we're effectively relying on teachers. Uh, you know, thank God most of them are like altruistically motivated because they have to spend their own money to like, you know, do things for kids and they're staying after school to help kids and stuff like that. Um, but I think there's an there would be an interesting test that you could run where you, you basically just tried this in a district and see see what happens. Um, at Primer, what, what, I, what we think about is how can you create um, – a, a sort of culture where the high status things to do, both from a teacher level and a student level, are the outcomes that you want. So like every school says they want like a bunch of kids to like, you know, go to good colleges or get good grades or whatever. But culturally, the high status things to do at these schools are be good at sports or bully other kids or, um, you know, date the most attractive person or whatever. And all those things are, you know, fine, not anti any of those things. But the but you know there's a great essay called, like about how humans are status thinking monkeys. We're all we're all constantly looking for what the status signals are and trying to understand the status landscape of where we are, and then we modify our behavior accordingly. And so I think a lot about how do you create a culture both for students and for teachers where the high status things to do are one to one correlated with the outcomes that you say you want as an organization. And so I spend a ton of time with teachers and micro school leaders and you know in Slack or on Zoom calls, sort of like reinforcing and congratulating and making a big deal lot of things that and to increase the status of the things that we're organizationally prioritizing and then with students the same thing and so if I'm you know on site in a micro school I'm constantly looking for the signals of like the things that the, the types of things that we really want to reinforce and then trying to reinforce the behaviors and again these things are not novel but I think that when you when you if you can be consistent about about that from top down in an organization you can actually create meaningfully different outcomes. Um, and then we do things like teachers' compensation changes based on how many students they recruit. And so a key input to unit economics is enrollment. And so we, teachers at Primer, make more money if they teach more students because it's more work versus in the public school system or the private school system, you just get a flat offer and as many students as they can cram into your class, they'll cram into your class. And so there's a lot of ways like that where we're trying to align the business's incentives financially with the teacher's incentives. Um, and so we're still, you know, in the early stages of figuring out what that looks like long term. But um, at every turn, we're trying to make sure the incentives are as lined up as possible with primers, long term success and student outcomes for micro school leaders, um, which ultimately is going to be how we win. There's a graph that I've shared on Twitter a couple of times that's it's a it starts in 1970. I think it goes through to like 2020 or something. Um, and it's a it shows at the bottom, like the reading and and math and science test scores just like basically flatlining where the cost while the cost of educating yep. students is just skyrocketing there's so much inefficiency in our system yep. it's getting worse and one of the things i also really love about what you're doing is you think really economically about the problem and the solution like a lot of people come at education from a pedagogical standpoint they have a set of hypotheses around what they think a good education should be and they mm. take issue with the failings of the system and they're trying to build something better. And you obviously have that too. You have a really clear point of view around what you think a child's education inside of primer sure. should be. But you also have a really clear sense of the economic bloat and waste. And I want to, this is again, a very open-ended question. Um, but I'm just very curious about how you think about the possibilities 
of reallocating the incredible amount of money that we're wasting on education. Like if we're freeing kids up from the public schools, we're able to build alternatives that are meaningfully competitive in the free market for significantly less. What are some of the possibilities that start to open up around the the places that we can innovate, the things that we can build, what the education system might be able to look like if we're not just wasting tons of money on bureaucrats that are really doing very little to help kids in their education and arguably are impeding them pretty dramatically. Yeah. We had, there's always like a funny, every time one of those articles drops, that's like, you know, new school budget, really a new like district budget released and like New York's going to spend $37,000 per student or whatever. It's not, I don't mm-hmm. know if it's the real number, but some, you know, one of those dr- articles drops, it always ends up in our Slack. And like, there's always like people from the education team, like, oh Lord, if, if we had $37,000 per student, like, you know what we could do? Like, um, you know, just dreaming about like all the things that we could accomplish for that. So I think, yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful that what I, what I think the best, the, the bull case for all this is that um, because you 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 need a functioning public school system. You need a you need a public school system in the U.S. that is um, ideally delivering way better outcomes, way more efficiently. That's happening now. And the best case scenario, I think, is that some of the things that are working really well uh, in the private models that are being scaled then can be taken, and the public school system can get a lot more efficient. Because I, it's not really. I mean, there are some districts that are underfunded. I think that's a, a fact. But there are. But most districts are not underfunded by any sort of rational evaluation of the budget. It's just that the capital allocation is totally out of whack. And so if you can start to show a model where, like my, my view is that most of the capital should be going to the teachers, the micro school leaders in our case, um, and then the second most should be on the sort of tertiary things that you need to do for students so they can have a great experience. And if you can start to show a model where that sort of basic premise generates results, I think you could have a lot of exciting stuff happening in the public sector schools if you had innovative states that were willing to try you know, things that that previously would have been like off limits from a public perspective. Um, so I'm pretty excited about the idea that some of these, like the the things that are working in the private sector could be actually go back and help make the public sector more efficient. Um, the other thing that I'm excited about is I think that that families, this, the, the anecdotal sort of like stories of families are starting to become more than just anecdotes. And um, I'm a pretty firm believer that that we need a lot more data being shared because right now it's basically like you know you have these anecdotes like oh I got you know I got access to this school and it was like this it changed my life and those are very powerful stories they are you know emotional they're moving um, but what you need is you need data of tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of students who you know shifted into a different educational paradigm and then very specifically demonstrate with real data what that did for them whether that was for future life outcomes future salary future uh, uh, you know, family quality, future, how you want to high quality of life, academic outcomes, college, whatever you want to do. Um, and so I'm excited for more of that data to come out because I think that's ultimately uh, how how we should be judging success. And you can debate which of those are more important, you know, obviously. Um, but I think that as more of that data starts to come out and it's less anecdotes and it's more data, you will have more people taking it seriously from the public side. Um, and then hopefully there'll be, uh, you know, willingness to try these models that are way more capital efficient and I think deliver way better results. If people have listened to this interview, Ryan, and they're either really excited about what you're talking about and they want to learn more about what you're doing, or they're a parent or a teacher who's interested in getting involved with Primer, where would you send them next? Uh, Shoot me an email, ryan at primer.com. Um, I would love to meet you, love to talk to you. Uh, if you're a teacher that's interested in launching your own micro school, regardless of where you are, we'd love to talk to you. If you're a family uh, or a parent that's interested in Primer for either your kids or your friends' kids, um, we'd love to talk to you. Um, we're constantly launching new schools. We're constantly recruiting teachers to launch schools um, and partnering with teachers to launch schools. Um, and so, yeah, and our website's primer.com. You can find me on Twitter at Delk. Uh, I'm pretty reachable there or via email. So always happy to chat. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks, Anna. All right, that's a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for being here. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, please leave a five-star rating. Ratings are how this show gets discovered by other people and it helps me bring in better guests. And no matter where you're listening, please like and subscribe to the show to make sure you don't miss a future episode. That's all for this week. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you next week.